In this episode, Chief John Schlittler will introduce the U-30 bandit case where several towns in the Metro West experienced a number of violent robberies in the spring and summer of 2009. The two bandits were eventually arrested in Needham after robbing a bank on Highland Avenue. Through the demonstration, you'll see how local law enforcement organizations, state police, and FBI work together with investigations. Then, Detective Adrian Anderson and Detective Mike Schlittler will talk about what they do on a crime scene. Now let's dive in. This is a culmination of an investigation we did back in 2009. It was a series of bank robberies uh, that happened in Metro West that used explosive devices uh, and a handgun, uh, or alleged handgun at the time. So we worked this um, investigation with the uh, FBI Violent uh, Fugitive Crimes Task Force, the NOR NORPAC um, Task Force, which is a task force, it's an anti-crime task force made up of 14 to 15 departments in Norfolk County. We do a lot of, uh, you know, narcotics investigations, but we do larger scales investigations, bank robberies, um, any type of violent crime or any type of large, um, you know, retail theft or uh, breaking and entering crimes. Um, those are the kinds of task force. So what happens is there are detectives from departments in Norfolk County that are assigned to the um, NORPAC task force. So we're able to pool resources um, and work together to try and uh, solve some of these crimes. So Monday, March 23, in 2009 at 1 p.m., we got a call for a suspicious device on the, you know, we could show this to the younger kids that have no idea what that <laughs> is, but I think you know the pay phone. So it's a pay phone. And that's actually at St. Sebastian's, um, at the St. Bart's parking lot, right before you get on to 128. So this right here is a, um, it's a robot from the bomb squad, Massachusetts State Police bomb squad. So they send that robot up to take a look at the device um, and determine whether it's safe or not. Um, and then they'll make the determination whether they're going to take it, dispose of it, or they'll actually deploy an explosive there to take care of it. So this is the, this is the device. They put a charge on it. They exploded it. Um, obviously, it's a circuit board, watch battery, wires to rocket motors. Rocket motors were, uh, was what they used for the kind of explosive element to it. Um, the bomb technicians did tell us that... Um, if this had gone off, that it would have caused serious injury to anybody that approached it, anybody that was around when it happened. So when that happened in Needham, we weren't sure what, there was no reasoning for it. We didn't know. Um, we weren't sure, you know, we're at, it's at a church, it's at a school, so we weren't sure what the target was. It didn't make sense. It's not something that we've been seeing. Um, so it was kind of new to us until the 26th at 345. So, and even to this day, um, when we get on, further on in this investigation, you'll kind of see, um, we're not sure if they used it as to, to see what our response would be or to see it as a, you know, how it would work as um, to, to kind of get us off the track of what they really meant to do. So we think what they wanted to do is see how we would respond and what resources we'd pull from off the road to deal with this because when you have a device like that that's the same way that it was in, uh, in Needham, we have to shut down a certain part of space, you know, so then we have to talk to the school, St. Sebastian, to say they got a lock in place. So we have resources everywhere that really leaves the rest of the town for, for somewhat uh, uncovered um, and we think that's what they were looking for. So on Wellesley, this is what happens. We get a call for a suspicious device. Wellesley calls, calls us, said we need help. We send police officers over. And as we're shutting down the roads uh, in around Star Market, which is right out of Wellesley Square, um, they get a call for a, a bank robbery down the street. So I don't know if you can X out and go into the, um, well, we're gonna, I'm gonna try and play the 911 calls from, from Wellesley. Yeah, that should go. Surrounding city of the town's on paper. 
We get that non robbery from the Bank of America, 342 Washington Street, not town. Suspect is uh, wearing a black cap, black ski mask, black warm up pants. He was on with a handgun. Believed to be traveling left on Washington Street. So we hold the cause. On the robbery, Bank of America, 342 Washington Street, in Wellesley. Suspect wearing a black cap, black ski mask. Handgun was shown, possible uh, bomb left in the building. Newton. Now go to the second one. Yeah. So Wellesley will send out a series of these goes over the air to all the to let them know what's going on. So the Wellesley John stays in town. Be advised. Bank of America 342 watch the street. <laughs> Should be one more. Welding control to surrounding cities and towns. Update on the 342 Washington Street Bank of America bank robbery. Male suspect entered the bank. Dressed all in black, black as well, black man, until the handgun left out the back door into a VW, either Jetta or Passat, the 456, possibly in the red. All right, just go back to the project. So keep in mind that the description of the vehicle, the Passat or the Volkswagen, ends up being a pretty big uh, item for us. Um, and also that there's two people involved in this, as we'll discuss as it later, um, as we talk about it later. But those are two crucial pieces of evidence that will allow us to tie in or actually now hone in on the suspects that we're looking at. So this is a picture of Wellesley. That's the state police bomb squad guy. That's one of our detectives, and that's one of the Wellesley detectives. So keep in mind that small department, you have four or five cars on the road. Now you have a shopping area that's got a bomb on it right outside. So we have to lock that down. We have to lock, so state police will give us an idea of we have to keep a perimeter on the size of the device. Where is the device located? What's the backdrop to it? So we have to clear a certain amount of people. We can have no vehicle traffic. Um, and at the time when this happened back then, we still were worried about radio transmissions that went over, thinking that there was some cases where if you key the mic, it might set off the, the imp improvised explosive device. So um, all these in mind that we're locking down this, now we've got a bank robbery where a gun was used and possibly another device was left. So these are two major crime scenes for a small, team, small town to deal with. So you can imagine the chaos. So this is it, 15 minutes later. This is the, the bank robbery you just heard the 911 calls. As you can see here, he leaves a similar type of a device. Um, not only does he have a handgun, but he has this device. And I think part of that was due to the fact that when he leaves, there's nothing that we, we can't get into that bank right away. So we're still trying to deal with that and the other diversionary tactic that they're using. Um, it ensures their escape is what they're thinking. Um, that this will give them time to get away with no, with no, no one following them because we were too tied up doing different things. So that, that was a picture, if you just want to go back real quick. So this is a picture of, you can see how far we had things blocked up. We have fire on standby, we've got police, we've got ATF, we've got FBI, state police um, that are on their way there. So this, this, this will happen, this will go on and shut down that road. This is 16 in Wellesley for, for hours. So this is holdup number two in Needham, Friday, April 3rd at 4 p.m. Um, same thing comes in. Uh, he's got a handgun, same, some of the same clothing. Um, and there is a device that's left uh, at this one as well. So that's what he does. They come in, they leave the device with the handgun and say, give me the money, and they take off. 
So this is Needham Center, obviously uh, Great Plain Ave, um, Chapel Street. So um, obviously you can imagine that the uh, chaos that this caused downtown. Um, and I want to say, if I remember correctly, they did it right at the time of the train. So, yeah, when we watched the video, we watched um, that they left the bank, went out over the tracks, got into a car, then the train comes in. So now we're cut off. We didn't know they had gone at, at that time, but that was the kind of the mode that they were thinking. So this is a picture of the device. Looks real. We don't know. There was explosive material there. There was gunpowder. Um, it definitely would have caused some damage. This is a picture of the uh, bomb tech going in. What they usually do is they'll go in and photograph it, or they'll take an x-ray of it to determine what's inside, and if they can tell that if it's active, it will, it'll go off and explode. And then they determine what they're going to do. So what he does is he takes it, and he puts it in this canister, which I wouldn't do, but they do. Um, and they bring it out, and they bring it to a place and detonate it. But as you can see, again, you know, this shut down Needham for a couple hours. Um, and, you know, obviously with the weather, it was, uh, it was quite a day. So, this, so now this starts ramping up again. So we've got two. Uh, there's going to be several more. But the FBI holds a press conference, um, offers a reward, knowing that this is a very dangerous individual, that he's going in with a gun and also an explosive device. So that's one of our lieutenants, and that's the chief at the time, Tom Leary, that were in, at Boston, in Boston, FBI. Um, headquarters and they, they, they had the press conference put out all the information that we had in hopes to get some tips. So hold up number three at Wellesley. Wellesley same guy, Wellesley. everything's the same. You have to go back out and... Bank of America, 342 Street. Just yeah, just exit out and down. then... Maybe not. Okay. Uh, so same. So hold up three. Same thing. Hold up number four in Newton, Wednesday, May thirteenth. So you can see how this is, you know, progressing and how they continue to do what they do. And at this point, as you can take a look, there's not there's not a lot of information that's going to help us. The only thing we have right now is is a white male, long hair, longer hair. Um, and the Passat or the VW. So that's what we're, we're going on. We have nothing else. So this is some more inside, some um, pictures of, of surveillance video inside the bank in Newton. Go to the next one. So when he leaves, they put in a die pack in the, in the uh, bag with the money. It explodes. So they drop it and leave it. Um, Lexington... Uh, <laughs> this is a little bit crazy how this happened, but so we got some information that um, that they, someone brought a tip in about somebody that might this they thought was a U30 bandit. So the FBI, and I want to say it was Boston. He, the guy lived in Boston. Um, they go to talk to this guy. He pulls up. Pulls up to his house as the officers are pulling up. He takes off, tries to run over one of the officers, has a firearm with him. Um, they take off. They go up 128 at outrageous speeds. They end up getting into a crash in Lexington, and he comes out with a handgun, and he gets shot. It ends up not being the U-30, but he had warrants. He had, he had a long criminal history. Everything that you would think would, you know, make this a, a viable suspect. Um, you know, so, w you know, we thought we were on the right track, but the mere fact that he came out with a handgun and threatened police officers um, shows what his train of thought was at the time. He was shot. He survived. Um, and he obviously did some, some time in prison because of not what he had done before, but also what he had done that day. Um, so that was a pretty... Pretty harrowing uh, experience. And you know when that happened? I want to believe it was early July because we were up doing a walkthrough of Memorial Park for the July 3rd fire fireworks when this all happened. So 
Uh, it, was, it was a pretty uh, interesting day. So this is holdup number five in Dedham, May 29th. Raincoat today, maybe because there's been a lot of rain when he's doing them. I, I don't, we don't know why he changed. Um, I think he has a different mask on this time. But everything's the same. R rushes in, comes out. U30 is because he's in and out in 30 seconds. So that was the whole idea. That's the FBI loves to give bank robbery guys names based on something. So we had one called the teardrop because. Um, every time he went in to do a bank robbery, he took a um, marker and he put a teardrop under his eye. And the thought behind that was that when you're looking at him and you, you, you're going to make an identification, you're focused on the teardrop, so you really can't get a good look at what he does. So, and we caught him too um, down. He was he he went to rob a bank. Uh, it's the TD Bank now, I think, by D'Angelo's down there, and we got him going onto the highway. So. All right, to the next one. This just shows he's very aggressive. It's almost like a takeover robbery. He does everything but jump over the counter. Another one hold up sick in Dedham, back to back in Dedham, back to his normal um, clothing and so forth. Another device down there. Same bank, I believe, in Dedham, too. Stoughton, Monday, June 8th, we, get, we have a drug guy. Um, a suspect gives one of our drug detectives a, a tip that, hey, uh, so-and-so is going to rob the bank in Stoughton, proximate time, and so forth. Uh, our detectives, the NORPAC task force, again, is there. Um, they set up in the bank, and the whole idea when he came in was they were going to get him in the in-between doors so he couldn't get into the bank. That was, and we'll talk a little bit later when we go to take down um, the U30 bank robber in Needham here, uh, what the plan was and how it worked out. So that was not the U30 bandit, believe it or not, the one in Stoughton. That was just somebody who um, had told a buddy of his that they was going to do rob a bank that day. Um, and his buddy had been in trouble with law enforcement, so he went to talk to law enforcement to tell him just to help his own case out. So this guy got caught doing a bank robbery early in the morning. So make sure when you're doing bank robberies, you pick the right person to go with you, right? <laughs> so Walpole, this ends up being one of the, the, the breaks in the case. Um, he does this hold up number seven in June. Uh, he does Walpole, Sharon Credit Union. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, so this is obviously the one inside. If you show the one, so this one is over, this one right here. Now, see right here? It's right in there. I mean, obviously when you're looking at it, and it's, not, it's a little bit clearer. A detective from Norwood says, hey, I don't know, but I think this is Dimitri Long. And so... Based on that, we start looking into information on Dimitri Long. Fits the profile, has a history. Um, believe it or not, the guy that he's living with has a VW. I think it was a Passat. So that remember when I told you early on in Wellesley that was going to be a key piece of evidence? Okay, so now we're like, all right, this, is, this looks promising. So we had meetings, um, if you want to go to the next one. So this is what we think. It's obviously a darker, it's a darker car. Um, but we, we think we're on to the right person. They both have drug issues, drug dependent. That's what we think their motive is for this, is to, to fuel their dependency on the narcotics. Um, the U30 bandit, Bob Ward from Fox 25, does a big story on it. Um, so we get the word, the word's been out there, obviously it's been very dangerous, but um, we now we think we're on the right track. So hold up in Needham, July 1, kind of the same thing, comes back. All right, so go, it jumped ahead a little bit. So um, I'll tell you, so what we started doing with this is we started setting up on uh, 
Dimitri and Michael Cody, who were the two suspects. So working with the FBI for several, if not a couple weeks, but several days in a row, every single day we'd meet, have a briefing. It was state police, bank robbery task force, all the NORPAC detectives. One day we followed them. They went to, we have video of Dimitri going into the Citizens Bank by Bagel's Best. Um, obviously he's not, you know, he's not robbing the bank at that time, but we have video of him coming in, going out the back, walking over the tracks, jumping into the trunk of the car, and the get a, getaway driver drives away. So they're doing a dry run. We're like, all right, so we're going to get hit soon. Um, and I, I want to believe that there was a propensity to be like later in the week, Thursday, Fridays. So we set up. We're like, all right. We set up our teams from um, 128 from the highway all the way to Needham Center. And we had travel teams that went out and followed them that morning. So um, that morning, they, they go out, they drive around. They're at Framingham. They go to Home Depot. He gets out, takes a plate off the car, puts a new plate on it. We're like, all right, this is going to happen. Uh, the plan was that they came up to Needham. They were going to come into the square. We had takedown teams. Um, we had teams in the back um, in the, the Chapel Street lot. We had teams out front, and we had teams following them. And the whole idea was to take them off before they got to the bank because um, we felt we had enough to, to pin on, on the other robberies as well. So we didn't want to create a situation that would be harmful because at the time, you know, he had a handgun, he had an explosive device, so we want to make sure everyone's okay. Um, in, the, in the chance that he was able to get into the bank, we had to stand down, let him get in the bank, and come out. So once he came out, we'd have people on, other sides, on the other side of the bank that would jump in and prevent him from going back in because the last thing we want to do is create a hostage situation. So as, as we're going on, um, they come off the highway. We got teams down in Needham Center. Um, they come off the highway and just they did a dry one three, uh, three or four days prior. We're like, they're definitely going to the bank downtown, right? Get off the highway, they start circling the bank next to the Needham Heights Fire Department. So we're like, we're set up other places. We're like, oh, all right. So we start heading down that way. We only had two or three teams with them, so they couldn't get to him before he got in the bank. Um, so they let him go in. Um, and while he was in there, we had officers come up from the side, and they were standing on each, on each side of the bank so that when he came out, they cut off his way to get back into the bank because we don't want a hostage situation. So... Believe it or not, it's, it's a thunderstorm now. So the plane had to bail out because he couldn't go through the thunderstorm. As we're racing to the bank up in the heights, the police station gets hit by lightning. We lose all our comms. We have no communications now. Our radios are dead. Dispatch center is dead. Um, so we're kind of out there. It's, it, the good thing is that we work together pretty well. Um, the state police had some comms. Um, it comes up in probably 30 seconds, a minute, but it was literally at the time when the guy's coming out of the bank and ba-boom. And it's like all of a sudden all you hear is like beep, 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 lo loud pitching noise. We can't use the comms for a mi bit. So um, I remember we pull up and the other guy's gone now. Dimitri Long comes out, sees the cops, drops the gun, everything, runs into the middle of the street on Highland Ave. This poor lady that was in a minivan with her kids is sitting there. This, he jumps, slide, jumps right over the front of her car into where we had boxed him off and the fight was on. And we're fighting with this guy in the middle of the street. It's pouring rain. It's thunder and lightning out. There's money everywhere. Uh, this guy's going nuts. People are, are flying. Every, no one knows what's going on. There's cars coming in and out. So we have an active crime scene in the parking lot, in the bank, and now we're still chasing the guy, that the, the getaway driver. Um, so I jump in the car with one of the troopers. We go over to Newton. We find out where he is. We go to the house. 
there's, they haven't worked on the, on the house, and there's a, a Vietnamese floor company that's in the house, and this guy was, did construction, um, and he had worked at this house a couple weeks before, and I guess it was some place he felt comfortable with or he knew where to go. So he's in the house, we're trying to communicate. Obviously there's a language barrier. It was, it was a disaster. And so now we know that you know, he might have a bomb with him. Um, so we had to, we got all the workers out um, and we're finally able to get him to come out. Um, and then they had to send the bomb team in. Um, and this is in some quiet neighborhood in, in Newton. So um, it was pretty interesting. Uh, this is him in the middle of um, Highland Ave. So you see he's got the bag. We're checking him for weapons and, and bombs. Um, and that's one of the detectives from Millis talking to him. Um, so this is, this is what happens over in Newton now because they're going to search his house because they don't know if he stashed an explosive device in there. So we have the car that he took off in and we also have to search this residence. We ended up doing search warrants and so forth. Um, and Cody had all the bomb making, he had all the motor, uh, the rocket motors and the um, he was taking the gunpowder on them and he was, what he was doing was making the explosive devices from there. So all that evidence was caught in the residence where he lived. Um, so it was pretty interesting and then you could show the video I think if you X out. This is uh, the U-30 Bandit. It shows where, how far he was, you know, and, and uh, how much, you know, other places that they hit. But, um, I, you know, in my 20 something years I've never seen anything that has been this extensive in terms of explosive devices. You know, they weren't something that, you know, he could detonate from somewhere, like they could have gone off. Um, they had all the components to it. If it had exploded, people definitely would have been injured uh, or maimed, uh, without a doubt. Um, yeah, hopefully that'll, yeah. So this is, this is him in the process. With Channel 5 being right there, they just showed up and they were recording the, uh, the aftermath of the bank robbery. So this is one of the troopers from the bank robbery task force in his pickup truck. Um, we're trying now to get resources to get out to Newton to try and catch the getaway driver. We had a pretty, we were pretty sure it was Cody. Um, but as you can see, these are all, these are all police cars, uh, unmarked cars. How did Channel 5 know about it? <laughs> Um, they didn't. The guy just happened to be driving by and, and it went, all went down. Yeah, it was because Channel 5 was right on the corner, so um, he started heading, he was either returning or leaving and he saw it and he just started taking footage. Bad luck for us, I guess, but it was okay. And we'll show you in a minute, they'll show, um, they'll show the parking lot where he dropped the stuff on the way out. So. As you can see, either side here, here, and here, and you can see the cars that were there, that's where the offices were. And, and the, the, that ends up being a Pelican, a Pelican. So when he came out of the bank, he had the gun up like this, and he saw all of us <laughs> converging, and he just dropped everything and tried to run, and he ran into all of us, and the fight was on. That's pretty much the end of it. So together, there's three detectives in Needham, and we work under a detective sergeant. Uh, all of us for the NORPAC uh, anti-crime task force, like Chief said, uh, we do a ton of narcotics. Um, other things, like this week, we had a, um, a suspect from a recent bank robbery about two weeks ago, um, some child pornography cases. It kind of just depends on uh, what the other jurisdictions have going on. Um, and that is really valuable for us, just because um, with you know, incidents in town, we don't have the resources that we need, so we're able to rely on that task force to have extra bodies, to have extra cars, um, things that we just wouldn't be able to have if we were just working with the detectives in Needham. Um, so today, uh, we're gonna go over a little bit of crime scene processing. We tried to figure out something that would be a little bit more interesting than just talking about it, so I'm gonna go over a little bit of fingerprinting and talk about how we pull fingerprints, why we pull fingerprints, and um, kind of our job when we go into a crime scene. Does anyone know what a latent print is? A patent print and a plastic print? 
Okay, so a latent print is something that, um, that you technically can't see. Uh, a lot of the times we call it human juice or like grease from your body. Um, people ask like, you know, what are fingerprints? And um, the hardest part for us is that a lot of these, these um, latent fingerprints, when we go into scenes that we want to pull, if we need uh, to figure out who's the suspect or we want to get their DNA or just a, a print, a lot of times we can't see them. So the most important thing and when we go into a crime scene is that we're not disturbing those crime scenes. Now, more often than not, we're coming in after the fact and the people running into the scene are the patrol officers. Um, we're all guilty of it, driving in, because obviously usually there's an emergency when they're responding, you know, and going into a house and not realizing touching the door handles, touching really important things that might ruin evidence, right? But there's a lot of evidence that we don't think of. There's a lot of places um, that fingerprints may be. That's why when we go in there, we make sure that we take a step back, we evaluate the whole scene. Um, patent prints are prints that are just in, um, like in blood, so if there's a drip of blood and you were to put your fingerprint in it, and then a, a plastic print would be like, um, I don't know, in mud or, or yeah, uh, like putty. a piece of silly, silly putty and you put your hand into it, or like paint that almost had dried, it's like a reverse print, so you get that imprint, you get the imprint in it. Will you go to the next one? So a fingerprint residue, or what we call like human juice, is 98% water or perspiration, and then 2% amino acid salts and fatty lipids. Now depending on the technique that we use to pull these prints, we're gonna want to target either the, the water in the print or the 2% amino acids and fatty lipids. So depending on the technique we use, is that's, that's what we're pulling from the print. Uh, you can go to the, the next one. So there's a ton of ways to identify prints, and most of you are gonna look at a print and say they all look the same, right? Um, but to us and to some people who examine prints for a living, there are so many different ways, and even the same fingerprints can look alike, but they'll be very different. Um, most often than not, they use sweat glands, which are these little tiny dots that you can see within the fingerprint, and other things called bifurcations, um, loops, swirls. Depending on the part of your palm or your fingerprint, certain, the skin um, tends to move in a certain direction, but every individual, even twins, will have different marks, different fingerprints. Um, so this is why it's really important when we're lifting prints that we try to get every, every little bit that we can because these, these aspects of the print are very important into when we send them off to the state lab. Um, you guys know that when, you're, when anyone gets arrested or um, applies for a firearm, you get fingerprinted, right? So there's this thing called uh, APHIS, and it's through the state, and all these fingerprints go there. So whenever we, get a, we arrest someone, say on a Saturday night in Needham, we bring them in, we book them, we fingerprint them. They get sent to, to the state, right? So there's this database. We have to make sure that we're doing a really good job taking those prints, because if that print pops up in a case, and we do a crappy job fingerprinting them when we arrested them three months prior, then they might not match. So that's really important, and that's kind of how we send off our matches. So if Mike and I go to a breaking and entering tonight, and we're able to pull some prints, we're going to take we're going to lift them, but we're first going to take pictures of them, and all that gets sent to the state lab, and that's how they try to match up prints with suspects in the database. Now, if someone's never been arrested, we're not going to have a match, right? And or conversely, if we take really crappy prints when we arrest someone, or they don't come out that great, um, they might not come pop up with a match. Um, all right, anything on this that you want to touch base on, Mike? Um. <clears throat> I'm Detective Schlittler uh, with Needham Police, and one of the things that uh, I really kind of gotten accustomed to and I really like doing is a lot of this forensics, the fingerprint stuff, and the crime scene processing. I just find it fascinating. I think it's something that we do more of than probably you guys would even think of. Um, being detectives, we're not assigned to a certain unit. I just don't do forensics. Adrian just doesn't do drug investigations. We have to do everything. We have to do bank robberies. We have to do fingerprints. We have to do all, everything. We have to do all sorts of sexual assault investigations. We have to do, we kind of have to be a little bit of jack of all trades, like master and none. You can't really specify in something because you're taken away from, you're taken away from a lot of other uh, aspects that you, you have to work as a team to do. That's why we have the NORPAC thing, which we'll get into in a second. Um, just real quick, some of this stuff, um, it, it gets kind of convoluted, but if you look at your fingertips, right, if you look at your fingers, you're going to see, if you look down at your fingerprints, you're going you're gonna to see 
all sorts of loops and whirls and the way they go. And some people don't even have whirls. They don't have loops. They have arches. You see this? There's no loop in there. And this one's a big circle. And then there's this... This little thing right here comes in. All of these things, a double, a double loop whirl, accidental whirl, which is just nothing really. All this stuff has to be processed by someone at the state police forensics lab. I can look at the stuff, but I'm not certified to do it. If I take someone's fingerprints and I get, say I have a, a plain whirl and I pull a, I pull a double loop whirl off a, off a window, in my suspect, I take his fingerprints, and he's got no double loop worlds. He's not the guy. So you can just eliminate it right, right away. Um, there's so much of this stuff that you can, that you can look into. What they, have, what they do with the certified um, fingerprint analysts is it's incredible, the amount of detail. And we'll get into a little bit of it um, without going too crazy. So like Adrian was saying, this right here is, is, a, is an arch a tented arch, all right? The, the, they've, they separate everything down into classifications. The first level of, of classification is the actual pattern, arch, whirl, double loop, whirl, whatever. The second more specific part of uh, detail that we have to look is, is the minutia of, the, of what Adrian was saying. So see, I don't know if you guys can see this. You see where these ends, these lines end? These are, these are all called ridge lines. So when you look at your fingerprints, all those little bumps that stick out, those are all ridges. And they all match together and they, they, get, they just form when you're in the womb. So it's like, I think four months old, they start to develop and they stay that way forever. They don't change. Not, you, can't, you can't really get rid of them. And I'll, show, I'll tell you why. But all of these details, all of these ending ridge lines, all these are unique. Okay? So if someone's going to process a fingerprint and you get a, te you get a tented arch, and you match up a tented arch to this, you're gonna find like a distinct point here. So you see where everything kind of comes together in the corner, where you could pick out like this little ending line right here. And you look over on the other print and you try to match up. And, hey, is there an ending line there? No, okay, maybe it's a different part of the fingerprint. Let's go to the middle. What, what on this fingerprint, if you guys can see that, can you see anything on this fingerprint that looks like outrageously distinct? Something that looks crazy, say, say it out, speak it out. What looks like weird in there that, that your eye draws to immediately? In the center, there's like a V. Right here, right? Yeah. So you look, at that, you look at that tented arch on another fingerprint, and you look right at the center of it. If they don't have that V there, it's, it's probably not the same print. But then maybe, all right, maybe, okay, the guy had a cut, and it, it was kind of covering that. So then you start going outwards. Okay, from the center of that print, out one, two, three ridges, is there a, is there a little little split here? No, and then you keep on going down. You have to get eight classification points to make a, a positive identification on a, on a fingerprint. But even more so, you get down into this. All these little things like, like um, Detective Anderson was saying, all these things right here, these are all sweat, sweat glands. And as you go out here and look for these ridge details, you can actually go further if the print's a really good print, if the person had like really sweaty, oily hands, you'll be able to see this. You can say, all right, well, where this ends, let's find something crazy. Okay, see where this ends right here? All right, at the end of that point, is there a sweat gland? Okay, no, there's not. Let's go down two, one, two, is there a split? Yes, all right, that's one point. Go down one more, is there a dot? Yes, that's another point. So you keep on working your way out from a known spot in the fingerprint to compare it. If you were to say, gut, gut reaction, fingerprints of DNA, what would you rather have? DNA. Wrong. You know why? Because people, two people can have the same DNA. No, Twins. Two people can have oh. the same fingerprints. Two people can have the same DNA. Not, nobody, not even identical, identical twins can have the same fingerprints. The problem is DNA is a lot easier to get, as we'll go over in a sec. Pair of twins, they separated um, 1,200 fingers of male identical twins, um, 940 fingers of female identical twins, 800 fingers of males uh, that were unidentical, and the same with females. This is the closest they came up to. If you guys look at this closely, I know it's kind of tough to see. This is the closest they came up to. See this right here? See this? 
not there. This is just right off the bat. You can tell these are probably injuries. Like, I don't know, is anyone here like a carpenter, electrician, ever had any like work with their hands or rocks or like, I, like my dad was an electrician. He's got scars all over his hands. If you took his fingerprints, it would look like, it would look like he tried to mutilate some of them. But these are, these, you can use these as a classification point too. If you're comparing a fingerprint, you can use these, you can use these scars and compare them to an, a known fingerprint or an unknown fingerprint and you can eliminate people right away. But this is, I mean, it's not even close. Yeah, it's a whirl. I mean, it, it's a whirl, but it's not, I mean, the delta is kind of, the delta is where everything changes, you know, like where, where it all comes in, like a river, like a delta, river, a delta. See how it, everything sprays off, but it's not even close. You got the double one there. You don't have it over here. You see what I mean? See how that, that, and that's the stuff that they go at. So they know that right away, they know it's not the same guy. It's easier to disprove somebody than it is to prove somebody, if that makes any sense. Say some guy commits an armed robbery or murder. Say he burned off the skin of all of his, all of his fingertips. So he has nothing on there, it's just flat skin. Is there any chance we can get a fingerprint off of that person? Palm print. Palm prints are by far the best evidence we have for fingerprints in terms of being able to identify people. So these are called major case prints. If you have a murder, armed robbery, anything that's a severe, uh, uh, serious felony, they're gonna, take case, they're gonna take major case prints. And that means they're gonna take your fingerprints, they're gonna roll your palm prints, and they're gonna, uh, you're gonna be able to use that for evidence. There's so much detail in here, like these little scratches, here, that's all recorded. You can pinpoint that stuff. All, there's like one of those deltas is right here and the fingerprints, so we just grabbed a palm print off of B&E Uptown, and it looks like it, I could just, I could just tell by looking at it, it looks like it's this area right here. Because they call this, they call this thing, it's called, it's called Mounds Over Flat. So you see there's like a little humps right here, and then it's, it's right underneath it. You see that, and you're like, oh, I know exactly where that is. It's a, outside of the palm. So a fingerprint analyst is gonna be able to nail a palm print. So I guess the first thing we look at when we try to lift prints is the, the, not only, okay, did we locate a print, but um, what type of surface it's on, right? So we identify two different types of surfaces. We have porous and non-porous. Now this is really important because this determines um, how we're gonna process that print, um, that latent print. If we screw this up, we screw up lifting up the print. So I'll go over porous first. Porous is anything that's absorbent, right? And what did I say fingerprints were? Anyone remember? Water, 98% water, 2% what? Amino acids, fatty lipids, salt, right? So um, if we have a porous surface like a piece of paper, the water is gonna absorb into the piece of paper and what's gonna sit on top? That 2%, right? So who hasn't showered today? Anyone? <laughs> I'm not judging. All right, go like this. Go ahead, get a little, get a little human juice on your hand. Okay. All right, now I want you to just put your fingerprints, don't slide them, put them straight down and pick them up. All right, so this is just one example. This is a porous surface. Um, with porous surfaces, we have a couple different types of um, products that we can use to lift it depending on if it is, you know, we have things that we can um, use on porous surfaces that are liquids. I'm gonna show you an iodine-based, um, it's, it's just called iodine. Essentially, it's iodine crystals and I have them somewhere here. So, How do I like, know? like what she was, while well, you're doing that, I'll, I'll explain that. Yeah. So, like uh, Detective Anderson was saying, um, when we look at a scene, when we look at a, a crime scene, we have to look at things kind of outside the box, not as us being cops or detectives trying to find a print. We got to kind of put ourselves in the mindset of a criminal. How, what's gonna be the easiest way to get into this, into this window? Am I just gonna go up there and go like this, or am I gonna like look around, am I gonna put my hands up here, look, you know? And you just kind of get a sense of where a person would use, put a hand on for leverage. A lot of times, we had a, a breaking and entering. We, we didn't get a hit on the, we got a good print, but we didn't get a hit on it. Um, guy was breaking in to a uh, business, and it had a walkway, a, a stairway, with a, with a steel railing. And right away, you can see there's a footprint on it. And we're like, me and my boss were like, well, this guy just grabbed onto the railing and went, 
like that and kicked it. So we printed the railing and we got we got a fingerprint. But like, who would think that you did that? It, you have to kind of think. You kind of got to think it in a different way, not the way that would make sense. You know, I mean, everyone just walks up, puts the rip. And, puts and it those in, are well. victimless, like those are not victimless, but those are crimes, right? Of a, a breaking and entering. If you've got like a sexual assault, right? If you have something, we're talking to the victim. We're, what happened in that room, right? Where did he touch you? Where did he touch the walls, right? Even the woman who taught me to lift print, she said one of her best cases, they had no suspect. She went back and talked to the victim, and no one had been in the room since the the rape. And then she went back and talked to the victim. She went through the room with the victim eventually, and they thought they pulled all the prints. And the victim said, no, he raped me over here, and he put his hands on the wall. She ended up getting full, two full handprints from the wall because she realized, OK, no one, no one thought that his handprints were there, right? So she was like, screw it. I'm going to throw some dust on it. They found two, two full handprints, and were able to identify the suspect. So stuff like that. It's, it's, when we have B&Es, it's a little bit different if the homeowners aren't home. But if we have a, a crime where we have a victim there, too, it's OK. Like, do you know where he entered? Um, is there anything that he touched? Did he rummage through anything? Or her, I say him, just defaultly. Um, but anyways, I'll go back to the, the porous surfaces. These are iodine crystals. Um, usually they come in a little vial. We're actually out, so I had to break them out of something else. Um, these are going to essentially bring out the fatty lipids or those, um, the, the amino acids, the fatty lipids, and the salt, and your fingerprint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that piece of paper. Did you put it on there or did you do it on the envelope? What's that? Was it on the paper or the envelope? The paper. Oh, okay. Because I left the um, I left the envelope in with my iodine. Oh, so right. um, I put it in a bag. I want to try to get some air in there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shake this bag. I want these crystals to heat up, okay? I want them to get, let me get it a little bit more. Yeah, I want them to heat up and rub against each other. So I'm going to close the bag. I'm going to shake it for about 30 seconds. I really want them to heat up because that's going to pull and stick to the fatty acids in the fingerprint. Did you take a picture first before trying to fold? Did you what? Did you take a picture first? Uh, no, you take, so we go into a scene, whether any scene, we always take pre-pictures. We take pictures of the scene before anybody touched it. I mean, after patrol has gotten out of there, we take pictures of the scene, show it as it is, and then we process, and as we find something, we then take more detailed pictures. I'll get into that a little bit. So you could have pushed a little harder on the first ones, but it's not bad. What's, That's what's, great, about, That's me. what's great about this technique you guys can pass. is you guys can pass that around. bank robbery, note, guy who had a note. He might have we gloves do on, I'll show you that next. but when he wrote the note, he probably didn't have gloves on. It depends on the surface. So we would, oh, so okay. like I'm saying, the, the, the surface really matters. So right, he's asking, would, would I dust that? You don't dust anymore? We do dust, but on a porous surface, I'm not going to dust, right? Uh, so so I'm only going to dust on a non-porous surface, and there are certain things that we do prior to that just to ensure a good print. So that right there is a really simple way. Um, and people are going to say, like, oh, what about all the mail scams? Um, and this is where we hate iodine. You see the table now? It, it makes a mess. Uh, it makes a mess. Uh, but people say, like, oh, you know, can you do that if, if for, like, the mail fishing and stuff? Well, unfortunately, once mail gets to your house, there's so many people that have yeah. touched it that it's kind of ineffective, it right? Look, it all look red. Um, but for stuff like a note at a bank robbery, it might be a great idea just to say, like, hey, why not throw it in a bag? Let's get some iodine on it and see what happens. Um, we would photograph that right away. Uh, we would, Mike has these little scales that we use. We put a scale on it. We'd photograph it, um, and then we'd send it off to the lab. One of the obstacles that we run into, too, is uh, this is obviously a great way to, to do non-porous surfaces. But what happens if non-porous surfaces would? You can't take a door frame and put it iodine crystals on it. Like you, you can't do it. So we have different types of powders. We have um, magnetic powder, which um, I would have brought. It, just, it, makes a, it makes a mess. It's, it's fingerprint powder, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't stick to each other. It's it's magnetic. So we have a wand instead of a instead of a fingerprint brush, and you pull, as you pull it over the the, um, the the powder sticks to the end of the wand, and you drag it over. It won't stick to what you're printing. It only sticks to the wand. So it won't stick stick and it won't sink into the little pores. This is magnetic. Yeah. So if I release it up, it all drops. Um, if I push it down, and what we would do is we would we would just dust the surface with this really lightly, and so it will not sink in. It won't it won't sink in, for and that we use that stuff. That is really really really. It's it's very very effective. It just 
If, on, if you're ever if you of a, how, uh, getting your house broken into, a car broken into, we make a mess. I, soap and water cleans it up. It's non-toxic. It just yeah. makes an absolute disaster. So um, moving on to non-porous. Non-porous surfaces are, are the majority of our surfaces that, we, um, that we're going to try to pull print, prints off of. Um, there are two things that we can do. Sometimes we, we do just go to dust, um, and, and we'll use, depending on the surface, um, there's a couple different types of dust. Like Mike was saying, there's a magnetic dust um, that doesn't drop into the surfaces, which is, is really useful. Uh, we have typical black powder, and then we have fluorescent powder, which we use for like really busy surfaces. Uh, for example, if you have a, a, um, a Red Bull can or like a condom, it's fluorescent. It's really hard to see. We're likely going to use a fluorescent powder. Um, one thing that we do do, it's called fuming. Um, if something's non-porous, um, we will likely fume it first. Fuming is essentially, it's super gluing whatever is on that object to it. Um, at work, at, at our station, we have a tank, and we use super glue. Um, we typically do it there because it's a controlled environment. I'm going to do. Um, like a travel size um, super glue just so that you guys can see what it does um, to fume it. And essentially fuming it's going to glue that print on to that surface. And then from there, we're going to dust it. So you, got, you guys ever seen the movie um, with Nicolas Cage, National Treasure? You guys ever seen that movie? You know when he goes down into the elevator and he's got the glass, the wine glass, and he puts the cotton ball in it and he sprays the glue? Legit. I mean, it would never come out that way. But that is, that's exactly, oh yeah. That's exactly what it is. So for our, um, we do use exactly what we talk, we use super glue. Um, what makes it activate is actually like cotton balls or these little, have you guys remember these when you were little? Um, the pipe cleaners that you use. So these will actually um, react with super glue and cause it to fume. I was just going to put it on a piece of paper so yeah, I didn't drip yeah. it. Um, so, you put a print on that. On this, on that thing. Yeah. Okay. I'll put one. I'll put one. Uh, put one over here. Put one over here. So. All right. So I'm just gonna drop a couple drops on this, and it's super glue, so the top obviously doesn't come off anymore. The uh, few things about the glue is it's super glue, and when it fumes, it it aerosolizes. If that's even the word. Yeah. And as it goes into the air, you got to be really, really careful. Because if that stuff gets airborne, there's been cases of if people didn't treat treat the product the right way, it gets in your eyes. And it super glues super your eyes. Super glues your eyes to your eyelids. So that's like one of those things where it's like put it in the tank, close the cover. So and the tank is very controlled at work. It's essentially basically a fish tank. Um, we have a little heating pad, and we'll put a couple of drops of super glue on, and um, and it fumes pretty quickly. So. When um, Detective Anderson did the uh, amino, uh, did the um, iodine, that sticks to the amino acids. It's only 2%, so that's like really hard to get. Those are really, because you're taking such a small portion of what you actually produce. When you do the fuming, you're taking the moisture, you're taking the sweat. So that's the moisture of the, moisture of the, of the print that's on the item, the super glue just adheres to right away. And it doesn't, it doesn't come off. It, like, it legit doesn't come off. You can take it off, then we dust it. We'll dust it, and then we'll be able to take a, uh, it'll um, be able to, it, it, this will come out white, so we'll be able to see it. We got a black surface for that exact reason. If you guys were to, like, rub this after we super glue it, it too, would, you wouldn't, wouldn't ruin the print at all. Um, it just makes it, you know, kind all of right, foolproof. I'll keep on going. So a couple of the other things that we use, too, um, iodine, ninhydrin. We actually don't really use, oh. So there's two types of ninhydrin. Ninhydrin is a known cancer-causing um, substance, but it's unbelievable at taking fingerprints off paper and stuff like that. The only problem is they were doing it aerosolized for a while, like you'd spray it into a fuming tank and it would suck the fumes out, but we, we don't do that anymore. When we get the new station, we're going um, to have a fuming chamber with all, everything that you'd need to safely use these chemicals. And we use liquid ninhydrin, so you just put the envelope in the liquid ninhydrin, take it out, hang it, let it dry. It comes out bright purple. It's, it's amazing. Uh, some of the other things I actually didn't put on here. Uh, so we went over super glue, magnetic, uh, regular, just regular dust, fluorescent powders. We went over that. So Wellesley, 
the guy from Wellesley who kind of is a guru with this stuff. And they had a kidnapping case, and they were able to get fingerprints off of duct tape. It was, it's wild how you do it. it. There's a special substance that you use. You get it all soaking wet. You put it on the duct tape, and it comes out like unbelievable on the sticky side. So DNA we talked about earlier, I just, I'll go over this briefly. Um, it can come off anything. Any sort of weapons, cigarettes, toothpicks, laundry, blankets, pillows, especially in uh, sexual assault cases, where you can locate the stuff. Hose, I mean, any, look at all, it's, this stuff is everywhere. DNA is everywhere. Um, you know, Lockhart's principle is very, very evident with DNA. Um, we recover DNA pretty, f we, we do it enough. Um, one thing that we do is, like comparison fingerprints, we get a comparison um, DNA. So we had a bank robbery case a couple years ago, and we recovered DNA from a, um, from a mask that we recovered. But we had, to get, we had to get comparison DNA, so we went to a person whose car it was, just to eliminate them, and we had to do a thing that's called a buckle swab. You take, you take a little cotton applicator, put it in their mouth, you know, move it, move it around a ton, put it in an applicator, send it out with your DNA sample, and they'll compare, the, the lab will compare it, and then you'll eliminate that person as a suspect from the DNA. You got, just kind of gives them one more step up. So APHIS is for fingerprints, CODIS is for, is for DNA. Uh, we have DNA samples. The, the fingerprint database, let's say the fingerprint database is this high, right? The CODIS database is about this high. So that's the other reason why fingerprints are so, are so good. Um, but DNA obviously is so much easier to recover. It's everywhere, um, but there's a lot less samples in there. I and mean, think about what you'd have to get to get a DNA sample in the CODIS. I, I, it, it takes a lot. Like you have to be, in Massachusetts, I don't think they do it anymore, you have to be committed of a felony. And we, when we you submit- have to do, You have to do time, I you have to do, do, You have to do a certain amount of time in state prison. So. CODIS and APHIS are all nationwide. So say I collect a DNA sample out in Massachusetts, submit it to the lab, and the lab comes up with a hit from somebody who's in, who did an armed robbery out in California five years ago. Now we've linked those two together. If I get a DNA hit, I submit it to, I submit it to the state police, and I submit it to CODIS, and it doesn't come back as anything, that now goes in as an unknown. So say in 10 years, my guy commits a murder out in Washington, now they can compare his DNA. It's gonna hit off my unknown and now give me my suspect. So you work with known DNAs and you work with known, unknown DNAs. It all just goes into the same database. And uh, it's, it takes forever. DNA, and everyone, like the, everyone sees the movies. It, it, takes, it takes forever to do DNA. I mean, it's just so much uh, chemical processing and stuff in it, it's, it's wild. Um, so like Detective Anderson had, had talked about earlier is photography is honestly probably the most important thing that we do. Um, so this is the one thing that I've learned how to do that took me forever, but this makes and breaks the cases. When you take fingerprints, when you take fingerprints, take a print, you develop it. Lifting it works about 10% of the time to send, you send, you lift the print, put it on a sticker, you send it out to the lab. That works sometimes, but if you don't rub the sticker down the right way, you lift it and you rip the fingerprint in half and it comes out terrible. But you take a f good f photograph of it in a perfect, perfect image with a perfect flash and resolution, that's better than any fingerprint you could ever lift. This is a car that had a gunshot, a gunshot hole through the, uh, through the post and there's a laser in here. This laser is invisible. So they put the laser in through the gunshot hole so it sticks out like this and it shoots. So what you do is you set your camera up on, on a setting, a real, real slow exposure setting. So you click the button on the camera and it doesn't click for like five or six, seven seconds. And while it's going, there's actually a person. You can kind of see his, you can kind of see his shadow right there. So what he does is he'll take a, um, he'll take a piece of paper and walk up and he'll... Uh, you have to reflect it into the camera lens. You're gonna do yeah, so, the le so say, say the, the laser's coming from over there. The exposure's so slow that you can't even see him doing it. 
he'll put the exposure right on a piece of white paper and just go like this and go all the way out to the end and the camera will just pick up the beam. So now you know where that gunshot came from, okay? So we do that with, for instance, we go to a car accident, a bad, we had a bad car accident a couple years ago. I'm taking a picture of it, it's snowing out like crazy. So how do you take a picture when it's snowing? There's freaking snow everywhere. You take a picture and there's just snow coming down. You can't see the car, you can't see the road. But if you do it right, we, have a, we set it up on a tripod, you do a real, 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 real slow exposure, it doesn't even look like it's snowing. It's just, it takes out all of the movement. For example, if we're, we have a big crime scene outside and it's, it's at night, right? And we want to be able to get a picture of the entire crime scene. But if you have a normal flash on, you're going to get about, what, three to five feet and then it's going to drop off. If you do a long exposure and you, ha you know how to work with your camera, which is why it's so important for us, is because we can actually put on a 30 second, a 45 second exposure and go around with the flashlight and add light to the scene and it'll pick up the light. It won't pick up me adding the light. You won't really see me, but you'll see all the light. So if there's evidence in the, back, in the background, we'll be able to light up the entire scene over that 45 seconds because that's most important. Because The most important part about this is when we get to court, right, and we sit on the stand and we testify to what we saw or what we went to, um, we want to have pictures that, yeah, we want to have pictures to show how dark it is, but I want you know, the jury to see, okay, well, this is how far the car traveled after it hit the person, or this is how far, you know, how many times this man stabbed the woman and you could see the droplets of blood. If it's really dark and they can't see that, how do I testify to that? How do I prove to them that that was there? So these photographs are so important for you us. You guys know camera, anyone here like familiar with cameras at all? A little bit? <laughs> so. The woman on the back? What's the F-stop? Yeah, that's it, that's it, F-stop, right here. You take something in, F, in F4, you're only focused on this. Look at how blurry everything else is in the background. This is very little light. It's a regular exposure. Click. It, this, is, this is just, there's a lot of light filling in there, so you really could take it in any, any setting. This is F22. F22 is, takes in no light whatsoever. So you either have to expose it longer exposure so that the lens stays open way longer, but if you even touch that camera while it's moving, it's gonna blur all the way out. This is the same picture, F22. Look at the focus, look at the detail in that picture. So when I'm taking a picture of a fingerprint, I want this much detail, I don't want this much detail. Footprint, so we get to the scene, we see a footprint. We have to set up a tripod, we put up a scale, so I can send this out to the, to the lab or the FBI, and they'll tell me exactly what size and what brand of shoe this is. And we do this with the camera on a certain setting at a certain distance with a certain amount of exposure on it. And it develops this, it develops this picture crisp. And I have like a, we spray this little, um, eventually we'll take a mold of this, we'll use dental stone and water, and we'll mix it together and we'll, we'll, pour, we'll, put, a, we'll put a little box around it, and we'll pour it and we'll get a nice, nice shoe impression so we can bring in to show the jury and stuff. Um, we do this with footwear, um, tire track, tool marks. We go to a, a breaking and entering, right? See these little marks right here? This is a flathead screwdriver. That's like a fingerprint. So if we, if we have a, if someone's breaking into a house and with a screwdriver, two weeks later, no one calls it. Hey, we got, a, we got a house got broken into. It fits exactly what you guys do. We get a search warrant for the guy's house, for his car. We find a screwdriver, flathead screwdriver. We take this picture out with scale, send it out to the state lab with the, with the actual tool, boom, they match it right up. See, because those aren't, these are not repeatable marks. These are individual marks that cannot be, cannot be repeated as the, machine, as the machine makes them. Tire tracks. We had an attempted B&E, it ended up not, not being a B&E, it was kind of a miscommunication type thing. But we treat everything as it's a crime until we, until we understand it's not. House was broken into, it was an abandoned house, and um, garage was broken into, who I thought it was broken into. Um, we went down, we saw uh, tire tracks, and we're like, you know what, like, let's just do this like it's a uh, really, really big crime. It gives us practice experience. So what we do is we see tire tracks. You guys remember the Aaron Hernandez case? Aaron Hernandez got nailed on tire tracks. It's all he, that, that was his biggest thing. Um, they had the tire tracks leaving from the scene. What they do is if you take a tire and it's this big, 
Yeah, but how big is it once you flatten the whole entire thing out, right? So you have to take portions for 10 feet of every section overlapping them, and then you, I have all pictures of this going all the way down. It shows the entire track for 10 feet. The thing about tires, same with footwear, they're all unique. This t I could send this down to uh, State Police Lab, or down, and they'll probably send it to Quantico down in Virginia, and they will tell me exactly what size, make, model, tire this is. The cool thing about tire impressions is I grabbed this one because this right here, like, yeah, you don't really think much of that. So this was this spot right here, I don't know if you can see it. See how these are all crisp? And there's something missing right there. So I get a car. Now I find this car with this tire on it. I pull that tire off. I'm looking for that mark right there. There's either a rock in there or a cut, cut off that piece of tread. So that tread didn't make a full impression into, into the ground. So that's how, that's, that's part of the reason why it, all distinct characteristics, just like fingerprints, a cut or anything like that, that stuff, that stuff can show up. So real quick, just a quick case study on kind of how we put some of the stuff together. Back of winter 2017, 2018, this is a picture from Channel 5. Um, anyone recognize this guy? This guy was a suspect in a, in a peeping Tom case. I would say over the, over the period of about three months, we had uh, female 911 callers reporting that they saw a male looking in their windows, uh, I would say probably 10 times, eight to 10 times, multiple times in the same house. We did surveillance. We did everything we could possibly do, and we still going at some aspects of it, but one of the things that we did is, you guys can kind of use your own imagination. We looked at, we had one of the couple of people, this came off home surveillance. Um, we did a footwear impression, which I'll pull up in a second. But we looked at the surveillance and we saw the kid performing some acts that we didn't think was what she should be doing there. So we actually went back and collected DNA from the side of the house later, later on that night when we went back, after we got back and watched the video. We were able to collect it, send it out to the lab, and we got a hit on it. It's exactly what we thought it was. It, was, uh, it was, came from a male. So we know it's active. So say in three years, if somebody in Minnesota does something with DNA, we now have our suspect. This is a footprint. This is very similar to the footprint I just showed you guys. But you see that like red, it kind of brings it out a little bit more so you can see it. And this, is, this acts as a binder. So I could put the, um, so I could put the uh, molding on there and, uh, and take it off. And this is actually the picture of the, uh, of the DNA that we were able to recover. You know what's crazy is knowing what I know, knowing what I know, I didn't have the tools to do this the way I wanted to do it because bodily fluids, urine, sweat, all that stuff shows up under alternative light sources. So regular lights usually gonna, is usually gonna blow this, you won't even see it. But if you use an alternative light source with a wavelength so the lights are a lot higher than regular, regular lights, you can see that thing. You can see that thing. Picture. I mean, I don't and know what I know. I'm not, I, I was surprised this thing even came out. But it was four degrees out, and me and one of the guys we work with are out scraping the stuff off the side of the house. So it's not all. It's not all. Uh, it's not all fun and games. Sometimes, you know. The other thing with this is CODIS. We submitted it to CODIS. One of the things that detectives that we do all the time with drug cases is inordinate amounts of surveillance. We sit in our cars for 8, 10, 12 hours a day just waiting for someone to come out of their house. Or it, it's kind of the, what you have to do. So this, this is kind of uh, chief, the chief kind of explained on this a little bit. Um, this is, we normally as part of Norfolk, uh, Norpac, Needham, Norwood, Dedham, Wellesley, Walpole, Sharon, Canton, Plainville, Rentham, Foxborough, Medfield, Mills, and, and uh, they put Norfolk in that's what in Norfolk. Um, Northern, it's basically northern Norfolk County. Mostly we do drug, drug cases. This is actually, uh, this was on the Norwood Twitter page. This is a joint Norwood-Needham case. This is, uh, this is Norwood, and this is Norwood. But we help Norwood, and we do all these drug cases together. I think that this one was our case, too. I can't remember. Um, but we'll, we go over to all these towns, and we help them out because Needham, this one, this one de definitely is 100% our case. Basically what it comes down to is our goal as police officers in the town of Needham is 
we want to help people. Most people who are involved in narcotics or the crimes that take place from narcotics are people who have drug issues, substance abuse issues. They have stuff that they've fought through their entire life. And I'm, we're not going out there looking to railroad the guy that is just honestly been addicted to drugs his whole life. R really, we're not. Unfortunately, it is illegal, and they gotta they gotta pay they gotta answer they gotta suffer the consequences, answer to their answer to their crimes. But we're looking for the people who are coming out and distributing to those people. Um, we want the stuff out of town. We want to keep the residents and need them safe. Uh, we got people who um, use narcotics with family members in the house, kids, and that's something that that's our main goal behind all this. I mean, we travel. We travel all over the place. We go out of state, we go down the Cape, we go anywhere we can possibly go. We go to the South Shore, we go to the North Shore, we go all West. We have guys that are assigned to the DEA in our group. And um, we will go, we'll sit in a car. I mean, we'll sit in a car for hours and hours and just follow cars around and watch them deal drugs and uh, build these cases based on evidence that we've seen. and putting GPS on cars, like we develop these cases and we, we work together with our with these towns, we get a large group of guys and we get along real, real well. And, you know, we, we like doing the stuff. I mean, it's it's great. We, I mean, like how many how many lives did Norwood and Needham save by taking, that is an incredible amount of, of, narco, of narco fentanyl. I mean, that, one of these, one of these bags right here would kill everybody in this room. That's how strong the stuff is. It's, it's insane. And, and we're seeing it everywhere. We're not just seeing it in um, like powder form now, which you know was known as heroin. Now, more, more often than not, it's fentanyl. But we're seeing uh, pressed pills that have fentanyl in it. Like this so, right so, here. Yep, those are pressed pills. And you're looking at people who you might think that's they bought an Adderall off the street or a Xanax off the street, and then they overdose, and it's because it's fentanyl. And we're seeing this stuff in everything. So that's why, for us, you know, we do this stuff because we're seeing it, and we're seeing it impact kids younger and younger, and families, and fathers, and mothers, and it's. Um, so one of these bags right here is probably like forty bucks. One of these pills as a Percocet. You guys remember back back like probably fifteen, maybe twenty years ago, all the pharmacies getting robbed for the Percocets. Yep. Remember, remember that was a huge problem. So now they don't even put them in drugstores anymore. They really don't sell them that much. But people love up in the Northeast. People love. Percocets, they love, they love the Oxy. They love the Oxycontin. These, they put them as 30 milligrams. 30 milligrams is like for cancer patients, people who are in extreme pain. They charge a dollar a milligram. One of these pills costs probably a dollar to make in fentanyl. They press it with a pill, a pill maker, and they put the number on it, 30 milligrams, sell for 30 bucks. Just made 3,000%. And it's still powerful, so they're still getting the high, yeah. but it's so much cheaper to make. Um, that's why we're seeing it everywhere. So for us, it's getting the drugs off the street. I mean, and, and they're coming in, and, and today especially, in, in record highs. Um, so yeah, obviously our, our goal is to get the source. Um, we can't always do that, but um, I mean, we see it in town when the bad batch comes in, we'll have a, a, like a handful of overdoses in a row, um, and then it'll kind of flatten out for a while, but um, yeah, the stuff's everywhere now, and, and you know, when we see it affecting families and kids, it's, and it's that's kind of why why we, we do what we do. We're willing to sit in the car all day, all night, um, but everywhere. like Chief said, when we get search warrants for these cars, for these houses, for these bodies, it requires a significant amount of probable cause, so on our end, the courts just don't give us the stuff because, you know, they want the drugs off the street, you know, we have to have enough information, so when we say that we sit, we surveil, you know, we're getting all this information so that we can write an affidavit that says, okay, like, I want, I want to get in the house because I know that something's going on there. More likely than not, I know something's going on there, and they grant that to us. But it takes a lot of information and a lot of time. So um, it's something that we're passionate about, and it's something that hopefully helps the community out because um, this stuff, it doesn't matter if you live in a, a poor town, a rich town, you know, a great school system, it, it knows no bounds. It's everywhere. It doesn't matter. What you have, it doesn't matter who you know, um, this stuff impacts everyone. A drug case can take months, six months, eight months. It's just so many moving parts and you gotta dot your I's, you gotta cross your T's, everything's gotta be in line. If you, because you go bring it over to court and it's not in line, you don't have the PC, 
They're like, nope, see you later, go get more, and then you got to start all over again. On top of that, it's like not even making sure we do all that, but then it's like, yeah. okay, who's around on Friday? And it's like, oh, everyone's like, oh, I'm on vacation. All right, yeah. I guess I'm pushing this till Monday. Is anyone around on Monday do the search warrant? So it's like, oh, yeah. do we and have bodies for ourselves, but also do we make sure that we're good at court? And there's so many moving parts. And that's it's the just... other thing, too, is this stuff doesn't happen Monday through Friday, 8 to yeah. 4. It doesn't. I mean, it's weekends, nights, weekends. Like it, it's crazy. I mean, new, we're doing New Year's Eve one, Christmas Eve one night. Like it, it's, it's just it, it is what it is. You got to. You, it's part. Of, it's part of the position. It's a great job. I wouldn't trade it for anything. But um, yeah, those are some of the. Those are some of the downsides. All right. Thank you for watching this episode. Next time we'll present our last episode and explain how the regional SWAT unit and the crisis negotiation team work. Stay tuned.